for needs, for the unresolvable things, when I'm at the end of myself. You know, when all else fails, we pray. But Jesus suggested a little different template. And, and you won't be able to put it in place because we've, we've thought about it for a few minutes. We, we may put it in place and hold it for a bit and we'll wander back off path. But you can, re, you can recenter it again and say, Lord, I'm sorry, today I didn't really seek you first. I, I kind of wandered through my day doing what I know to do. And I didn't really listen to you or ask for you or ask for your perspective or invite you into the midst. But, but I want to seek first your kingdom. Look, I don't believe what's in front of us, we're going to be able to negotiate in our own strength and our own power and our own ability. So the time to begin to exercise this faith muscle is now. The, begin, the, the time to begin to develop this particular spiritual discipline, it seems to me, would be now. Don't wait until you're desperate. It's too difficult. If you haven't read your Bible and you haven't prayed, it's really difficult right now in Ukraine. Their daily Bible reading plan is not nearly as important as having put the Bible in their hearts every day. Jesus said it, seek first my kingdom. Look at Romans 12, 1. It's a supporting verse. It said, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices. The imagery is a little blind to us. We're not involved in a sacrificial system in any way any longer. Unless it's just a woke culture, but that's not what Paul's referencing. He was used to a system of animal sacrifices where they would take an animal and slaughter the animal and collect the blood and then put the carcass of the animal onto the altar where it'd be consumed by fire. So that by the time the animal was placed on the altar, it was empty of any self-determination. Its life blood had been drained away. So he's using that as a metaphor. He says, offer yourself, not as someone void of any self-determination, but offer yourself as a living sacrifice. He said, that is your reasonable service to the Lord. Jesus said it a little differently. He said, seek first my kingdom. A living sacrifice. In Romans 8, similar idea. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. The same spirit that brought Jesus out of the tomb is alive within you. Why would we not yield to that? See, these verses aren't particularly significant. They don't mean much to you if you don't give much credence to the existence of evil. If you don't believe evil spirits exist, if you don't believe unclean spirits influence human beings and behaviors and thoughts, then you really have very little interest or very little sense of necessity in being in tune to what the spirit of God within you might do or say. But if you'll accept by faith what the scripture says, that there is a whole kingdom of unclean spiritual forces. And their attention is targeted at the people of God. Then we would be beyond naive not to listen to the counsel that we're giving. When Jesus said, seek first my kingdom, it's because there's there's the voice of another kingdom that will assault your mind. And if we live in a fallen, evil world, the messaging that comes from that world system will very seldom encourage you to seek first the kingdom of God. They'll do their best to make you discontent and dissatisfied with the things of God. So we're invited to offer our bodies as living sacrifices and to recognize that the spirit that brought Jesus from the dead is alive within you. You're not alone. So this isn't just an expression of self-will or self-determination or a new expression of self-discipline. It's not like a new diet routine. It's identifying there's a conflict in the earth. There's a battle that takes place beyond my physical body, beyond my five senses. That's not illogical. It's not irrational. It's not some new idea. It's not the lunatic fringe. If you'll believe in a virus and you won't believe in the spirit of God, you need to consider very carefully why you consider yourself a Christ follower. Why would you trust God with your eternity if you didn't believe he could make a difference in time? Makes no sense to me. And if we've been so fortunate that you can think you manage your your own journey through time, you've lived a privileged life. 
But I can say with a good deal of confidence, there are circumstances that will beset you or somebody you care about that you can't control and you'll want to know there is a God and that you could have a relationship with him. The Bible talks to us about a battle of angels. I like to think about the angels. I brought you a passage from the book of Revelation, chapter 12. I want to start here because it's New Testament. Some of you prefer that. As if there's a higher value in the New Testament. Do you understand that's not a biblical model, right? That will get you in the weeds. That's another lesson. Revelation 12 and verse 7, there was war in heaven. My opinion, this is still in front of us. But there was war in heaven and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. And he wasn't strong enough. And they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. The, the, the John... The disciple closest to Jesus has a vision, and a part of that is he sees the heavens, and he's, he's back and forth between what's happening in earth and what's happening in heaven. And he sees this war in heaven. And it's very clear in what he's watching and what he relates to us that the war in heaven has a physical impact upon the earth. Now you can say, you know, I don't believe that, but you're ignoring the counsel of Scripture. Or you can prefer some metaphorical interpretation or something that's illustrative in some other way. But, but how do you know when to apply that and not to apply that if that becomes your method of interpretation? You know, angels are a part. I, I don't know that. And the, 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 it seems there are pivot points in the story of Scripture where there is an unusual amount of angelic activity. Now, I don't know if that heightened angelic activity is, is unique to those seasons or it's simply that the narrative we have gives us, pulls the curtain back in those seasons. But we can certainly say there are pivotal times in the unfolding story of the earth where we're told there is heightened angelic activity. For instance, when, the, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, it was an event largely overlooked by the power structure or the religious community or anyone else for that matter. But the shepherd's fields outside Bethlehem were filled with the heavenly host. Glory to God in the highest, right? I mean, it, it shook the shepherd's cages. Is that, a, I mean, they left the sheep to go find the baby. Not normal behavior. Babies were born in Bethlehem frequently and the shepherds didn't abandon their post. But the sky being filled with the heavenly host with a message about a savior being born, good news for all, off they went. Heightened angelic activity, Gabriel with Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, and Gabriel with Mary, and Gabriel with Joseph, and the, the, the sky is filled. A lot of It's an honor to be with you today. We're still talking about the battle in the heavens, but we're going to look specifically at Daniel's life. He's one of my heroes in the Bible. Daniel lived his entire life as a slave in Babylon. He's born in Israel. He's Jewish. But his life corresponds with that time when the Babylonians overran Jerusalem. They destroyed the city. They kept some of the brightest and best young men. They took them back as slaves to the city of Babylon. Daniel had to lead the life of an overcomer. He overcame empire changes. He overcame the jealousy of his peer group. He overcame the personal disappointments. Just think about it. All of the dreams and ambitions he might have had as a young person were impossible to him. They could not be fulfilled. They weren't available to him. He could have been angry, resentful, bitter. He could have hated God. He could have withdrawn from people. And yet he chose to honor the Lord with his life. Three times in the book of Daniel, God sends an angel to tell him he is highly esteemed in heaven. Our lives aren't perfect, but God can write an outcome that will make you valuable for his purposes. Open your heart and hear what God has for us today. You know Daniel? Young Jewish man in Babylon. God has punished Israel and Jerusalem's destroyed by the Babylonians. The temple is destroyed. Many of the population have been slaughtered, but they've taken some of the brightest and the best with them back to Babylon. 
Jewish scholars suggest it may have been the first Jewish ghetto in history. Jewish ghettos filled the European landscape for a long time. And the Russian landscape. But in Daniel chapter 10, there's an interesting scenario we're invited into. It says, at that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food or no meat. No wine touched my lips. And I used no lotions at all until three weeks were over. He's not mourning as as if he were grieving someone's death. It's mourning in the sense of a fast. He has humbled himself. He's eating simple food. He's doing, he has set himself apart to seek the Lord. And on the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of the finest gold around his waist. His body was like chrysolite, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze and his voice like the sound of a multitude. Again, our topic is battle in the heavens. And Daniel began to seek the Lord, to fast and to pray. And he's three weeks into that. And standing on the, the, the bank of the Tigris River, he sees an angel. And I, I think it's just noteworthy as we begin this little exercise that the angelic visit was initiated by Daniel's prayers. He fasted and prayed and an angel was dispatched with a message for him. We're going to look at the message in a moment. Again, it's worth noting that heaven responded to Daniel's prayers. And may I insert here that heaven responded to the prayers of a slave. Daniel wasn't a king. He wasn't empowered. He was in the midst of a very disheartening set of circumstances. However much time allows us to look at, we're going to look at some of Daniel's circumstances. But he was in a very broken a very despondent place, a place where it would have been easy to have abandoned his faith. I'm going to ask you, do you have the imagination that God would move in your life even if your circumstances were less than you would prefer them to be? Or do you have the imagination that God's really only welcome in my life? I'm not even going to seek God, certainly not invite him in, and certainly not going on an extended fast if God isn't moving to alleviate the things that I've drawn his attention to. Now, so much of our relationship with the Lord is about identifying for God the things he's overlooked. And we kind of acknowledge he's busy, his schedule's crowded, there's those people, all those other people praying. How do I get my prayer to the top of the list? And he doesn't always give attention to what I'm trying to get him to focus on and the time I want him to focus on it. I'm not the only one here, right? Everybody's looking at me like I'm on a, taking a walk, but I think we all understand that circumstance. But in the midst of this, that's not what Daniel has done because his personal circumstances aren't really what are on the table. So I'm asking you to imagine that in the midst of difficulty or hardship or something that's requiring perseverance or endurance that leaves you dissatisfied or broken in some way that you would prefer not to be, that God could give you a significant revelation of himself that wasn't about the circumstances that we've been drawing his attention to. I could say it another way. My journey to this point would suggest that there's a price to be paid if you're going to experience a breakthrough from the Lord. Very seldom have I been able to celebrate breakthroughs without there being some requirement attached to that. Not that you earn it, But there's the reminder that in the midst of the brokenness of that place, that the power of God is made evident, and you're very clear that you didn't generate it, you didn't cause it, you weren't the initiator of that. I'm very suspect that people suggest that we manipulate God. God will never be manipulated by us. I want to skip back to the, I'm going to come back to Daniel, but I want to go to the book of Acts for just a minute. It's an advantage of giving you the scriptures. Emotionally, keep your finger in the book of Daniel. (laughs) But in Acts chapter 10, it's Cornelius' house. Cornelius is a Roman centurion, a Roman soldier in Caesarea, a pagan city. At the center of the city of Caesarea was a temple to a Roman god. Observant Jews wouldn't even go there. And in Acts 10.30, 
Cornelius makes this statement. Four days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon, and suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Jaffa for Simon, who's called Peter. He's a Roman soldier. A lot of good, observant Jewish people in the land of Israel. Attending synagogue, attending the, the holiday celebrations, observing kosher, keeping the rules of Moses, doing the things they know to do. But God responds to a Roman soldier. It says, as Cornelius said, I was in my house praying at three in the afternoon. It suggests that was his habit. And a man in shining clothes, an angel, stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. If Cornelius had not cultivated the habit of prayer and being generous with his resources, and he wasn't giving to the Roman soldiers, he was being generous to the people whose land he was occupying. You think he took any heat for that? You think his peer group celebrated when they heard about that? God responded again in the same way that God responded to Daniel's dreams. God responds to Cornelius, I'm sorry, to Daniel's prayers. He responds to Cornelius's prayers. Our prayers initiate heaven's responses. How is it we've been content saying, well, you know, pastor, I just don't pray that much. The men especially. Well, I don't know how to pray. Learn. When we say, I don't know how to pray, what we're in effect saying is, I have learned to live absent God. I don't invite him into much. I don't ask his opinion very often. We have accepted some statements and some habits and some practices that have left us diminished. And I want to go back to Daniel. Chapter 10, I want to hear the rest of what that angel or a part of what that angel had to say. He continued, don't be afraid, Daniel. So if the angel's saying that, what is Daniel? Frightened. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard and I've come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now, I've come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future. For the vision concerns a time yet to come. He has an angelic messenger that has arrived with a message from God who says he's highly esteemed and has even come to talk to him about what's going to happen in his life. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I suspect most of us would rather have information about what's going to happen to me than what's going to happen when I'm not here. Do you understand how much we've been coached into kind of a personalized faith? It's about me and mine and what we want and how do we get more of it? And I'm not sure that's evil, but I know that it's often not fruitful in the context of the kingdom. And in the season that we're walking through, I think we're going to have to cultivate a different imagination. Daniel 10, same chapter, verse 20, he said, do you know why I've come to you? Soon I'll return to fight against the prince of Persia. When I go, the prince of Greece will come. But first I'll tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except Michael, your prince. A bit of history, there were four consecutive Gentile, non-Jewish empires that began ruling over Jerusalem in about the fifth century. Babylon, Persia, Greece, and then Rome. And this, the, the angel that's come to visit Daniel said, I, I was withheld by the prince of Persia, and when I go back, I'm going to have to confront the prince of Greece. There's an empire change. You believe there are spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places that influence what happens amongst nations on planet Earth? It isn't politics. Do you understand what we've abandoned when we said we don't want to talk about current events? We take our faith and we put them in the realm of the theoretical or the prophetic The only time we would talk about current events or the only lens we have is some prophetic event about the end of the age. So whatever's happening in the world has to go through the filter of the end of the age. If there's a war or a rumor of a war or something that happens, it has to be the end of the age because that's the only filter we allow where current events can cross over with spiritual activity in our lives. And we have diminished our impact because of that. I suspect if the Ukrainian Christians had adopted an American theological position, they'd be saying it's the end of the age tonight. 
I suspect we'd feel like that if there were tanks rolling down our streets. Hey, it's Pastor Allen. I want to interrupt the message for just a moment. I have something that I think will be a strength to you. No surprise, we're walking through a season of tremendous shaking. It may have begun with COVID, but it's continued far beyond that now. This is no longer just about a virus. And I think in the midst of it, God is moving, not a fearful time, but a very important time to know how to stabilize our lives, our families, our homes, our businesses, most of all, our heart. Well, the most important, if you ask me for the single most important thing I know, it's a systematic daily Bible reading. That will do more to ground you than anything I know. But we've built alongside of that a little daily devotional called Standing Firm. And it's really intended as a companion for your Bible reading, a little short a reminder each day of the faithfulness of God and how it will bring stability to your life. Something you can read, share with your family or a friend. We've put it together in a devotional. I believe it'll be a blessing to you. Get a copy and spend time every day in your Bible and learn to stand firm. Standing firm in our faith is not a passive response. We must be overcomers, and that requires intentionally drawing close to God every day. Pastor Allen's one-year devotional book, Standing Firm, can help give us strength with scripture, encouragement, and prayer every day. And it's a quick and easy addition to your Bible reading time. It's your generosity that enables Alan Jackson Ministries to spread salt and light across the nation with messages like this one through radio, television, and the internet. And we're so grateful for your partnership. So today, when you donate $25 or more, we'll send you the Standing Firm devotional. Read it each day and let it encourage you to boldly stand for your faith where you live and work. Request yours when donating today by going to alanjackson.com or by calling 800-880-5102. Getting the latest messages from Pastor Allen has never been easier with the Allen Jackson Ministries app. You can watch and share your favorite television broadcast whenever you'd like. Plus, take part in any of the live stream services from World Outreach Church. If you're on the go, listen to the latest podcast and radio programs as you go about your day. We want to make sure you have tools to help you grow in your faith. Find useful resources like devotionals, daily prayers, and small group studies designed to help you in your spiritual life. Plus, you can join us in our daily Bible reading plan. Read it on the app or let the app read it to you. You can even partner with us in the ministry to help make our messages available for free in as many places as possible. Wherever you get your apps, just search Alan Jackson Ministries and look for this icon. Download the app and be encouraged by the word today. Now, I want to spend a, <laughs> a moment with Daniel's journey. I at least want to open it. We'll continue it in the next session. I think he has so much to say to us to help us understand this battle in the heavenlies and the necessity of being an overcomer. You know, the book of Revelation is written for overcomers. Every one of the seven churches at the beginning of the book of Revelation is told they have to overcome. And at the end of the book of Revelation, it says that all the promises will be given to the one who's overcome. Overcoming presupposes, it, it, it assumes that there's going to be obstacles and hindrances and barriers. If there weren't, you wouldn't have to overcome. I don't like that. May I, just, I just, may I state that? I would prefer not to have to overcome. I would prefer it was just a downhill pull. Do you know what that means? You're too sophisticated for that. Have you ever had to push a um, a wheelbarrow or something up a, an incline, it's harder work than if you're going downhill. I don't want to have to overcome the incline. I don't want the extra effort, the extra energy expense. I don't want the extra sweat equity in it. I would just prefer the downhill ride. Now, having, having noted that, that's not what the Bible promises. It says we're going to have to overcome evil with good. That evil exists and it will have to be overcome. That's true in your life and my life, in our lives together, and in our world until the Prince of Peace arrives and establishes his ultimate victory. 
But between here and there, we have to be overcomers. We, we're better at overlooking. We'd rather overlook evil than overcome it. Well, it's just not that big a deal. Not my problem. We've said that for so long until now, it's hard to look any place where it isn't our problem. We said it about our schools and we said it about our universities. We've said it about our lack of integrity in business. We've said it about our lack of morals and how we've engaged. We've just overlooked it. Not that big a deal. We've wanted to be inclusive or tolerant or accepting or something. We didn't want anybody to say we judged anybody. So we've spent a lot of our time and energy in recent years in the church, and I've spent my life in this window, so I'm not throwing stones at anybody else, but we haven't been particularly developing our overcoming muscles because we've been overlooking a lot. But if you have to deal with a horse that's too excitable, too aware, a little too frenetic, you put blinders on them, you, you shield so that they can only see what's directly in front of them. You can keep them moving in a straight line. We've been a little bit like that. We just didn't want to look. We didn't want to talk about it. It was inconvenient or uncomfortable. We knew what we wanted to get. We knew the agenda we were trying to push down the road. So we don't want to be bothered by having to take a broader biblical perspective that every human being was created in the image of God, that every human being was valuable, the sanctity of human life. Those were just kind of uncomfortable realities. We had other agendas that we prioritized above them. We didn't destroy them. We didn't put them in the shredder. We just said they weren't top priorities. We didn't lead with them. Hmm. And God's begun to shake us. And we're beginning to wake up. I'll take the first section of Daniel's life because I think it sets the tone for the entire book. Daniel chooses humility over hate. We could use a bit of that. In the church, we could use a bit of that. Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8. Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. And God caused the official to sow favor and sympathy to Daniel. Daniel had three friends with him. We're introduced to them together. Again, we could miss that a little bit. Daniel's life in Jerusalem was defined to a great extent by what he ate. If you've never lived in a culture where kosher rules are important, it's hard to understand. You know, we talk a lot about food here, but not because we have such great boundaries. We just have an obsession with food. And we talk about organic vegetables as if there's some other kind, but that's another discussion. <laughs> but I've lived in Jerusalem and, and dietary rules until today are a big deal. If you stay in a kosher hotel, the rabbis come to inspect the kitchen on a regular basis to be that sure that the food preparation and the food service is being done in a kosher way because you can't mix meat and dairy. And they have to have separate utensils to cook one or the other and you can't do them at the same time in the same place. And you have to have separate serving plates and utensils for whether it's dairy or whether it's meat. And that's just kind of the doorway into the beginning of the rules. Everything is defined by how you eat. Your godliness, your holiness, your righteousness, your purity, your zeal, your concern for the integrity of scripture, scripture begins with your fork. And that's how Daniel has lived his whole life. And now Jerusalem is gone and he's gone from Jerusalem. And the temple's been destroyed and there's no more rules. And the priesthood can't be found and the structure has crumbled and the the temple that reminded you that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob watched over us was still in our midst. But now Daniel is hundreds of miles away in a foreign capital before a foreign king that eats things that are unthinkable to him. And it's a time when he should have been angry and furious and enraged and filled with hate and bitterness. I mean, his faith has been put through the shredder. How could God have allowed that to happen? The message by the false prophets was God has delivered Jerusalem time and time and time again. He'll deliver us this time. Don't listen to Jeremiah. Jeremiah's too grumpy. God won't judge us. There were dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of false prophets saying, don't listen to that. That's not God. God's going to bring us through. The message that was heard overwhelmingly with more frequency was God will deliver us. He's always delivered us. Have you ever been disappointed by a message that didn't come true? Don't raise your hand. That's Daniel. 
And now he's serving as a slave in the palace of a pagan king. And the first thing we learn about Daniel is he asks for permission to maintain the integrity of his diet. I'm going, are you kidding me? Of all the responses. And watch what God says. It's Daniel 1.15. At the end of the 10 days, he asked for a 10-day trial period. The man responsible for him was afraid. He said, if, if, if you don't eat our food and you don't do well, the king will take my head. Ancient Near Eastern monarchs did not have a court of appeals. It was their opinion that was the rule. And he was afraid, so he gave him a trial period of 10 days. At the end of 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. And to these four young men, God did something. God gave them knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. But we go back. Seek first the kingdom of God. Offer yourself as a living sacrifice. The same spirit that brought life to Jesus' mortal body is within you to help you. There's a battle in the heavens today, folks. It's not just in the fields and the streets and the cities of Ukraine. It's not just in Canada or on our southern border or in Washington, D.C. or wherever else your attention may be directed. There's a battle in the heavens and the church has a role to play. You and I have a role to play. Our voice makes a difference. Our prayers matter. Our willingness to meditate upon the word of God and allow the spirit of God to direct our prayers makes a difference. And if we abandon the arena, we are far more guilty than whoever abandoned our people in Afghanistan or turned a blind eye to the potential of Putin invading Ukraine. Don't be angry at others. Begin to talk to the Lord with a new intensity, with a new seriousness and saying, God, is it possible I have been unaware or disinterested that you're more willing to be engaged, that you have, you have more to be said or more to be done than I've been willing to entertain because I've been busy trying to get you to do what I wanted you to do. I've had really marginal interest in being engaged with your purposes. There's a battle in the heavens, but. We're working through a little study under the title of Escaping the Descent into Paganism. And I believe we are witnessing the paganization of America. And it's not happening at a slow speed. It's not happening in gradual increments. It's happening more rapidly than I ever imagined possible. And our goal in this, and it isn't just our nation, this just happens to be the place God has planted us. That was his choice for most of us, not our own. The, the, the challenge is how do we escape that? Because I believe if you don't have an intentional plan, if you haven't purposefully built an agenda so that you are um, consistently and systematically engaged in things to help you, you'll be swept up in the, the floodwaters of paganism. It is that prevalent. It's that confusing. It is that widespread. It's infected academia. It's included the business communities. It's, it's, it touches every aspect of our lives. And tragically, it's influenced our churches. If I had to, to look for a singular response, and I did because I wrote the outline, <laughs> I would suggest that obedience if you'll be obedient to the truth that you know, that's your single best safety net. Do not willingly compromise. I want to take a moment and, and look back with you at this life of a Christ follower. It's so important. We know how to be saved or be born again or join a church or be religious. You know, we know the words we're supposed to use and the beverages we're supposed to drink or not. You know, we, we kind of have this fuzzy awareness, but the real life of a Christ follower has escaped us. If we had been better salt and light, we wouldn't be in this mess. The problems we have are not the result of the wicked. They're the, they're the, it's the indifference of the faithful. 
And I don't say that to bring shame. It's just the best analysis I know, but we can change. In Philippians chapter three and verse 10, the apostle Paul is writing. By this point, I think it's fairly safe to say he is mature in his faith. He's certainly an effective advocate for the cause of Christ. And he said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. That's a very odd combination of statements. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. All of us would say that. If, you've got a, if I ask for hands, who needs a miracle tonight? About 90% of us could stand and say, that's me. And you would have specifics around that invitation. Names or circumstances or a diagnosis or it's legitimate. Our lives are filled with stress. So when Paul said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, it's like, yes. But then he says, in the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, and it's like, maybe. <laughs> maybe later. Maybe somebody else. Couldn't I just empathize with somebody that was sharing in his sufferings? But then he doubles down and says, becoming like him in his death. Jesus was the perfect, sinless, obedient son of God. He was rejected. He was accused falsely. He had enemies almost every place he went. He was constantly being presented with people trying to entrap him with his words or find an inconsistency in his behavior in his own hometown. They were just angered because he told them the truth. They tried to kill him. Ultimately, he's betrayed by one of his closest friends or certainly one of his closest followers. When that happened, his closest friends wanted nothing to do with him. They denied that they knew him. His trial was a sham. They lied about him. They perverted the legal system in order to orchestrate his, his execution. And finally, God himself forsook him. Becoming like him in his suffering. We get torqued up if we can't park where we want to at church. Oh, come on. This is family. We do. You know, I'm not going back. The traffic is terrible. I'm thinking when we see the Lord, that's really going to be awkward. You know, I'd have gone more often, but it was just terrible. I want to know you in the power of your resurrection in the fellowship of sharing in your suffering. I want to learn to be like you even in your death. It doesn't stop there. The next phrase is the most startling in this passage to me. So somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. That goes almost 180 degrees against contemporary American evangelicalism. This is the Apostle Paul. Jesus himself recruited him on the road to Damascus. Jesus himself, the Lord appeared to him. And then Ananias came and laid his hands on him and said, the same Lord that appeared to you sent me to talk to you. And he spent time with the apostles that spent time with Jesus. I mean, you, it's, it's safe to say that his training and development has been above average. And listen to what he has to say that somehow I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. We don't live with that. I don't want you to live in fear of your salvation. That's not what I'm suggesting. But we have a hubris, an arrogance. We have a self-righteousness. Well, I'll tell you one thing I know. <sighs> I don't hear that in Paul. Do you? So is it possible that there's a little attitude adjustment that would be beneficial to us? You see, if, if, if we imagine there's nothing to be gained, if there's nothing required of us, nothing to be asked of us, nothing to be demanded of us, then we have very little interest. But if we live with the urgency that he's describing in the life of a Christ follower, listen, he said, I want to be like Christ, even at the point of his death, emptied, God, not my will, but yours, so that somehow I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. I mean, it's more important to me to be obedient to the Lord today than at any time in my life. 
I'm not pointing at achievements or accomplishments or awards and going, well, you know. (laughs) Baloney. It's a Greek word. Means I disagree. In the South, we make sandwiches out of it. But it started as a Greek word that means I disagree. No, it didn't. I made that up. I don't want to lie at church or anywhere else. Verse 12, not that I've already obtained all this. Again, listen to this. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. That is not passive language. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. If you just listened into the conversations of the typical church person in our culture, it seems to me the attitude of the church does not suggest we have found the pearl of great price. It sounds to me more like we picked up something at the dollar store. Come on, you know it's true. Oh, it's every, every, anybody can have it. It's available to everybody. Just say a little prayer. Excuse me. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords was tortured to death on a Roman cross that you and I might have access to the kingdom of God. And when I was a rebel and wicked and ungodly, the spirit of God began to call me and draw me. And only through the sacrifice of the Son of God could I even be considered as a participant in that eternal kingdom. And God in his grace and mercy has given me that opportunity and you as well. It's more valuable than any, any, thing, any asset you own, any opportunity you've been presented, any degree you have earned, any achievement you could point to. It's the greatest defining honor of your life. Now that's our truth. And if we're going to escape this descent, this plunge into paganism, we're going to have to understand the beauty, the majesty, the wonder of the gift that is ours in the redemptive work of Jesus. This is Pastor Allen, and I want to invite you to join us in Middle Tennessee. We're having a spring festival on Saturday evenings. We're having church outside. We put up our outside stage. We'll have a worship service. We have a guest artist. There'll be a concert after service, food trucks. The church community will be there. And then on Sunday morning, we step inside and you can be a part of a worship service in Three Crosses Sanctuary in the middle of the World Outreach Church community. It's springtime. It's growing season. And I want to grow spiritually this year. I'd like you to grow as well. Make an investment in a trip to Middle Tennessee. Be in the midst of God's people. Open your heart to the Lord. Let's take 2022 as a year when we invite the Spirit of God into our lives so that when we face the next challenge and disruption, we've prepared our hearts and our minds and our souls. I'll see you soon in Middle Tennessee. You see, prayer is not passive. Men, I think, are often reluctant to really give themselves to prayer. We think it's some sort of a passive response. It's quite the opposite. Prayer is an assertion of spiritual intent. Prayer is inviting God to bring his resolutions into our lives. When we pray, all heaven moves. Angels are dispatched. The courses of nations are changed. The destiny of your children is altered. We can't afford not to pray. I want to share an idea with you that will help you take prayer outside the church and outside those places you expect to find a prayer, you know, just before a meal or before bed or in the middle of a crisis or in a hospital. Prayer needs to be integrated into our lives 24-7. Let's call it Let's Pray. You know, we're social creatures. I live in the South and we're polite, so we ask questions that we don't really care about the answer to. How are you feeling today? You know, we're not not really listening. We just ask to be nice. But if you'll listen, people give you a lot of information. Well, I don't feel great today. We just changed to daylight savings time and I haven't had much sleep. Or my kids have been sick and life's been really hectic. Or my car broke down or whatever. But in that moment of sharing, there's an opportunity. You can commiserate with them 
or you can say, let's pray. Now, here's my suggestion. When you hear that moment, don't ask for permission. Don't say, may I pray with you? I feel led to pray with you. Just say, let's pray. And after you say that, close your eyes and offer a one sentence prayer. Only one sentence. Don't quote a verse of scripture. Don't tell them your favorite pastor's name. Don't give them a sermon reference. One sentence. Lord, help my friend. They're tired. Give them strength. Amen. Lord, I pray you'll make clarity in the confusion. Amen. What at one sentence. And after you've prayed, say amen and move on. Don't wait for affirmation. Don't wait for encouragement. Invite God into your world. It'll change it. Let's pray. Those Let's Pray moments provide a simple and easy way to pray for others. And today, we're offering a tool to help focus your prayer time at home. Pastor Allen's book, Let's Pray, provides 30 foundational prayers that can help fuel your prayer life. It also has scripture, inspiring quotes, and helpful questions for each day. Remember, the time we spend praying can change the course of nations and clear the way for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's your generosity that enables Alan Jackson Ministries to continue broadcasting messages like these. And we'd like to send you the Let's Pray book as a thank you for your donation of $10 or more today. Request your copy by going to alanjackson.com or by calling 800-880-5102. The life of a Christ follower, it, it, it's worthy of some reflection on our part. We've lived presumptively. It's an amazing gift, just an amazing gift. Let's contrast it for a moment with this descent into paganism. It's happening, it's happening so rapidly and so with, with such prevalence, we're becoming anesthetized to it. Immorality, wickedness, ungodliness, it's more the norm than it is not. In Psalm chapter 1, there's an interesting description. It describes a downward progression. And it describes an alternative. It says, blessed is the man. God blesses men and women. Did you know that? Well, he's going to describe a path you can choose that will bring the blessings of God to you. They're not arbitrary or just random. The Bible reveals to you what God will bless and what he won't. And it's a very self-defeating life to choose a path that God has said he will not bless. You can try hard and work hard and be diligent. You can do many good things. But if you've chosen a path that God said he will not bless, I assure you it will not turn out well. On the other hand, you can choose a path that God has said he would bless. And in spite of difficulty and the intrusions of evil and wickedness and all those other things, the blessings of God will come to you. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. There's a downward progression there. He said, don't walk in the counsel of the wicked. Don't listen, don't, don't attach value to what the wicked have to say. Stop it, he said. If you do that, you'll find yourself standing amongst the sinners. If you'll take counsel from them, you'll go stand with them. And ultimately, you'll go sit in the seats. You'll go take a place with the mockers, those who stand in opposition to the things of God. So it's a pretty good little reference list, little litmus test for where you are, maybe on different topics. Don't think of it across the breadth of your life. Think of it in terms of your time or your financial resources or your social life or your moral values. Think of it in kind of those different categories. What is it that's helping you set boundaries? Who is it that's driving your agenda? Who's feeding your thoughts? What are you watching? What are you listening to? Is your counsel coming from the godly or the ungodly? Do you spend your discretionary time with the godly or the not so godly? Do godly people annoy you? They used to me. Oh, come on. I mean, I didn't want to go to hell, but I didn't really want to go hang out with Christians either. Have you not been there? I mean, I think, oh Lord, surely not. I wasn't clever enough to understand it was revealing that what was not on the inside of me or what was. And if Christians bug you, you think you're smarter than they are or more talented than they are or more whatever than they are, you don't really like to hang out with them. You got a little homework to do. Because I promise you, when you get to heaven, them's the ones going to be there. 
bad grammar, but you got it. So the counsel of Psalm 1 is, listen, don't get onto this descending path. Then we're given the alternative. But blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Rather than walking in the counsel of the wicked, you spend day and night thinking about what God has to say. Not just doing your daily Bible reading, but actually taking it at the heart, trying to put it into practice. You're like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever you do prospers. I've given you these before, but if I, the, the big indicators of kind of this descent that I'm describing to you, uh, I think they're pretty clear. Lawlessness, and in the New Testament, the word for lawlessness is really ungodliness. It's not just a breaking of laws. So law, ungodliness, wickedness, that seems to be flourishing. Is that, is that what you see? Certainly what I see. Week over week, it's as if they invent new ways to be ungodly with more boldness and they're more brash about it. Corporate America's on board. I mean, I was happy just to get like a Coca-Cola. I didn't really need them to preach to me. You think Disney protected kids. Lawlessness, violence, feels like that's increasing to me. The statistics would suggest so. Debauchery, it's a fancy word, New Testament word. It just means excess. It's just more than you need. Opulence. We're not content. We believe we deserve it. We have a right to it. We've worked hard. You understand, I, I hope that most of the world works very hard for far less. I don't say that to make you ashamed or guilty. God has blessed us. And the fourth uh, indicator that I could see is the occult is just exploding. And it, it's a word that has many facets to it, but fundamentally the occult is when you reject the truth, when you reject the, the true, a true spiritual life and you promote the false. You don't just tolerate it, you promote it. The outcome of this rise in the cult is we have an abundance of false prophets. In almost any segment where you look, you can find them. You can find them in religious settings, but don't imagine they're abundant in the church. People use thus saith the Lord in such a casual way, it makes me more than nervous. I don't want you using my name unless I gave you explicit permission to do it. And that's just me. I'm a little country preacher. Imagine using the name of the Lord. If you can't make a statement and it carry the authority based on your character and your integrity, why are you dragging God's name into it? Now, I believe there are times when God speaks to us. Now we're walking through this series of talks. My objective, as I've said to you before, is to walk with you as we consider some of these invitations that God has put in front of us. I'm wanting you to reflect, not just to agree or disagree with me, but to reflect upon your own life choices, to consider each one of those God choices that you have made, how you've responded to God in your life. You'll have some sense of those places where God has put before you an invitation. And I certainly want that to include conversion or but I don't want it to be limited to that. God gives you invitations far beyond those big initiation points. God invites you on a regular basis to serve him, to be honest, to live with integrity, to humble yourself. If it's a step which you've taken, I've been encouraging you to take a few moments beyond a worship service, beyond our time together and reflect upon the outcome. When you've said yes to the Lord, what have you learned from that? How did you experience that? Did you do it with some anxiety initially, some trepidation, some uncertainty? What did you experience from saying yes to the Lord? Did he keep his end of the bargain? Did you find him to be faithful? Did you grow more comfortable with godliness? Maybe you had to say no to some expression of ungodliness. You had to take a stand that perhaps cost you a relationship or cost you an opportunity or you had some forfeiture with that. How did that turn out when you look back on it from the perspective of hindsight? If there's an invitation which you have not accepted, you just kind of put it on the shelf. My prayer is that you'll be persuaded to say yes to God in some new ways. We've used Acts 26 where King Agrippa said to Paul, you've almost persuaded me. I don't want anybody to be almost persuaded. I won't get all in. I do. But you know, being all in today doesn't mean I'm all in next week. Because God's going to continue to invite me forward, I pray. 
It's just been a few days ago that we had the pastors from Belarus. They serve churches in Belarus, which is a European country on the border of Russia and Ukraine, but they, all, they also oversee a number of churches in the Ukraine. And his wife looked at us that Wednesday night and said, I hope you understand we're not just fighting for Ukraine, we're fighting for all of you. She prayed for us in Ukrainian and I didn't know the words, but it felt like the spirit in her resonated with me. If you haven't watched that service, it still lives in the online archives on, on our website. But one of the, the, one of the lies that was in our media there for a little while was that the Ukrainian president was trying to establish himself as a dictator. You heard it in multiple places that he was canceling political opposition and banning his opponents and yada, yada, yada. And when they sat here, they said, you know, you don't, they said, we heard it on your news and we had to turn it off. They said, you don't understand the Ukrainian people. They lived with a dictator and now they've had a short, they've had a brief period of freedom and they will never again live with a dictator. They would rather die fighting. And they said, if Zelensky tried to establish himself as a dictator, they would take him out. The awkward part was they looked at me in private and they said, do you understand how precious freedom is? And the answer was no. They said here on the stage, they said, don't listen to these invitations to socialism and communism. They said, they promise you free education and free health care and free something else. And they said, we've lived, we live in that system and it isn't free. They said, after it's in place for a few years, they said, we go to the doctor, we don't get good health care unless we pay the bribes. That's not some theory from a theologian. In Belarus, they said, we can't invite children to our church. It's such a privilege to be with you again. We're continuing our study on escaping the descent into paganism. We're watching it happen, but I don't want you to be filled with fear or anxiety. Two things are happening simultaneously. The darkness is growing more intense, but the light of the kingdom of God is growing brighter. We have to decide where we will focus our attention and what we will give our attention to. Being angry and resentful and embittered or frightened isn't helpful. Being filled with a message and the joy of the kingdom of God can make all the difference and enable us to lay up great treasure in heaven. Turn your eyes and your attention and your attitude towards the Lord. He has an assignment for us in this season. I've been talking to you about the opportunity to believe. Joel 2.32 says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The foot at the cross, the, the, the base of the cross is open to everybody. It's open to everybody. Romans chapter one and verse 20 says, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. Every human being is given a presentation of God. Now we happen to have some tremendous advantages. We have churches and the freedoms to broadcast Christian media and we can own Bibles. And if you speak English, Christianity is more open to you than any other people group in the world. So we have many blessings, but the scripture is very clear that if you live in the most remote places in the planet and you're illiterate, God still provides a revelation of himself. God will reveal himself to every human being. We have no excuses. See, those of us that have the most, we also have the most excuses. We do too much traffic. Churches are too big. Churches are too small. We have kind of a Goldilocks approach to faith. We're looking for that one that's just right. We're going to have to understand the opportunity to believe is a tremendous gift. Those invitations that God puts before us are of inestimable value. They are such a privilege. Lord, thank you that you would put an invitation in front of me, that you would reveal an aspect of my character that needs attention. God, thank you that you would convict me of something. God, thank you that I know right and wrong. I may struggle with right and wrong, but thank you that I know the difference. Forgive me for the brazenness of my heart. The opportunity to believe is such a gift. I want to take the minutes we've got left. I've got a few. 
and unpack this a, a bit more. I want to in, invite you into this idea. I've mentioned it to you before in these last few weeks about let's talk. In the same way we learn to do let's pray, to take prayers outside the church. I believe it is imperative, particularly now, and I don't mean today, but in this point in time, that we learn to have faith conversations beyond this place. That faith becomes a matter of your conversation in daily life. Thank you for that enthusiastic affirmation of that radical idea. It's not really a radical idea at all. It's grounded in scripture. Ezekiel 33, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, speak to your countrymen. And say to them, when I bring the sword against the land and the people of the land choose one of their men and make him their watchman. And he sees the sword coming against the land and blows the trumpet to warn the people. Then if anyone hears the trumpet, but doesn't take the warning and the sword comes and takes his life, his blood will be on his own head. I'll give you the shorthand. Tell the people to be watchmen. And if they see destruction coming or wickedness coming, if they sound the alarm and somebody chooses not to listen, then it's not on them. But if they don't sound the alarm and the consequence comes on the people that they didn't warn, God said, then I'll hold you accountable. See, we've kind of embraced the opposite of that. Don't talk about faith and politics. We all understand that. Not just at church. Don't do it when your family gets together. Certainly don't do it at a holiday. Don't do anything to disrupt. It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. Because not everybody there is godly. Not everybody there wants to be godly. So let's just not talk about it. How about them Titans? The weather in Tennessee, you get all four seasons every week. We just ignore the counsel of Scripture. But I'm going to walk with you through a series of places where their willingness to say, let's talk and to have a faith conversation. And I'm asking you, I'm imploring you, I'm pleading with you to begin to have faith conversations. It's the reason we give away mugs. It's not that we're trying to support the coffee industry. Then they were imported from China. So there's a whole nother set of stuff with that, but we don't make them at home yet. So, hey, I know. Let's start making some stuff. But it's easier to have a conversation with something in your hand than not. This is a very biblical principle. It's not something I'm making up. We can start with Paul in Ephesus. You know the the book of Ephesians in your New Testament. It's written to the church in Ephesus. And we're given a couple of little windows into that church and how it got started and how Paul came to know them. There's a lot of emotion around that, a group of Ephesian believers. Well, in Acts 19, it says, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and he arrived at Ephesus and he found some disciples and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So he said, well, what baptism did you receive? And they said, well, John's. I read that and I think, Paul's different than us. We'd roll into town and you meet the disciples. You go, is there a restaurant you recommend? What's the weather like here this time of year? Are there any sites of interest I should see? I've got a couple of days while I'm waiting on the rest of the crew to get here. Anything I shouldn't miss in Ephesus? That's not what Paul did. That's not the, that's not the tone of what he had to say. He meets the belief. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? We're reluctant to even say to somebody, what kind of church did you grow up in? Well, it's none of your business. What do you mean it's none of my business? You'll ask them if they played Little League. You'll ask them what part of the country they moved from because there's nobody left here that started here. Everybody's come from someplace else. And we're glad you're here. I came from someplace else. I had to learn to talk like this. In fact, I have varying shades of accent depending on whom I'm addressing. It can get worse. 